Uh, yeah, my name's Jimmy. It's boring. And uh, I, I saw your videotape on how um, you move objects, and it was terrific, just amazing. Uh, the only problem with you and the difference between you and me, you went and showed it to the government, <laughs> and they took it away, and I'm not showing mine to the government anymore. anymore. I showed it once, but they didn't believe me. So um, real quick, I want to show you my engine, and this is a two-cylinder engine. Uh, 400 horsepower and I move objects this way along on wheels like a bus, a truck, <laughs> a car, an airplane with, uh, this is free energy, there's no input and basically I work on a, on a vacuum. Both of these cylinders are totally vacuum with uh, inert gases, helium and uh, the other five gases which are xenon, krypton and neon and uh, what I do is I take energy from one solar transfer from this one and take energy from this one transfer through all this maze of wires. I don't have any power at all whatsoever. The power must come from the empty cylinder uh, to the firing cylinder and then the firing cylinder switches it back to the empty cylinder and fires the empty cylinder and back and forth and so on. I use a coil just like a regular car and I use uh, 24 volts, so that's the only input I have, 24 volts. This is an alternator down here, and this is just like a regular car, and all this alternator does is uh, charge up the batteries. It's not hooked up yet. Charge up the battery, so, so we keep 24 volts always. Like your car, just you gotta keep it all charged up. Um, around this side, John, this is a tiny can that we built. And basically, I time the firing sequence of the spark plug. That's all. It's four, and it it times the coil because each coil is separately uh, functioning. And um, and these are the switches here for the various coils with a timing sequence. So basically, I have the coil, the timing sequence, and then I have the pass, uh, resistors over here. These are variable. Resistors. And, and the reason for the resistors is I create so much energy here that I have to get rid of most of it. Basically, I create somewhere around a thousand volts with about uh, 600 plus amperage. And the volts are fine. I can use the volts. I can't use the amperage because they'll burn my electrodes. So what I do is I get rid of all this energy. Uh, 600, maybe a thousand amps. We could use to light up the house, but for the time being, I don't need it so I get rid of it. And that's about it. Down there I just have two batteries. And uh, actually the two batteries are just for the spark plug, to fire the spark plug and to put 24 volts. These coils will take 24 volts and that's the only reason for the spark plugs. And the engine basically runs by itself in a vacuum in a void and the energy comes from the vacuum and the void. Now over here we're going to move real quickly over to a one-cylinder engine. And I started out with this one-cylinder engine. You, we have a small Tesla coil here. And like you, John, I got a bunch of old parts. <laughs> Most of this came from electronic sales. And this is an old 1930 switch here. And I got a bunch of old other switches here you can see. Um, I, I, I have a system here. Uh, this is a uh, variac which I can adjust the RPM. This is strictly RPM and this is an old beat up distributor that I use and once again the coil and a spark discharger here. Tesla coil and the cylinder here with two coils. Normally I use three but I wanted to see the reaction. I wanted to see, you'll have to see the videotapes. I wanted to see what is happening in this empty chamber, in this vacuum chamber in which I have a spark, like your car, but no gas, nothing, empty nothing. And the biggest explosion happens in there, and this piston here is slammed down, and there's no way in the world even five guys can pull this piston down, and it'll turn the crankshaft, and of course turn the, um, the car, or the bus, or the truck. Uh, over here, John, real fast, is an old, lab in which I use to treat the gases. 
And here I have a, a, a Tesla coil situation in which I have these are coils wound one way. Inside here there's another coil that's wound the other way. And then here I have a focus coil wound this way and the other side I have a focus coil, coil found, wound the other way. And then the gases come right through here and I treat them. Here I, I get these tubes and I break them up. I put a new envelope, glass envelope, and I put stems on it so my gas comes in here and I bombard it with uh, gamma, uh, I'm sorry, um, uh, cathode rays. And once they're bombarded with cathode rays, then it'll go into another uh, component. Um, I have x ray tubes, I have um, high frequency tubes. This is a high frequency tube here. Actually, it's a, it's a cathode ray tube. And this is a cathode ray tube, and I take and put little holes in there and put little stems and run my gases in there and treat them. This is a reverse polarity tube, and these are iron filings that I use to affect the gases as the iron filings are magnetized through a focus coil. And I have some more high frequency tubes. These are hydrogen retention coils, and of course, my vacuum gauge. Uh, over here, real fast, there is my piston. Very different from a car piston. It's hollow. <laughs> Empty. So this is a vacuum. I draw a vacuum through here, and this one goes in here. And this will go up and down with the crankshaft. This remains steady. This is bolted onto the other engine. And I have uh, an anode, cathode, copper, negative, positive. And these are electrodes, and this is tent loom in which I create X-ray, gamma rays, etc. in here, which affects the gases, which affects the vacuum, which affects the positron. This is just a um, um, vacuum tube in here, and my gauge is over here. And, and, and I tested all these gases in here, and you can see the big explosion. You'll have to see my video. The big explosion, and since this is plexiglass, carbon uh, derivative, it pulls the carbon atoms and of course I get sun. But that was only for the purpose of looking inside the atom to see what the release of energy looks like. And you can see all of them are basically the same way. And we had hundreds and hundreds of experiments and we were able to see energy being released by the atom. And then over here I'm doing a brand new lab all together and I can test gases in here and we can look, I guess, once again we have we have windows 99, 96 <laughs> and we can see our gas and I test them in here with high frequencies and always in a vacuum. This whole system here, John, is in a vacuum. Uh, this is a purifier in which I eliminate from my gases any radiation from cos what I call cosmic radiation which would affect my gas. My gas has to be totally pure of cosmic radiation. That's what this little gadget is for. This is an ion gauge tube in which I ionize my gases to perfection. And these also, I'm still, as you can see, I'm still working on it. <laughs> Maybe I'll be ready for your next birthday. <laughs> and this is a, um, an argon depolarizer. And this is basically my um, my control panel, very simple, not very complex. And over here I have a magnetic coil, actually I have four of them. And I have magnetic coils, high frequency, and then my gas going through the center. And as you can see, we're not quite ready yet. But anyway, we're here, maybe a couple months. I'll prepare my gases here, and they're ready to be put into the engine. And then, of course, the engine's ready to run for the next 10 years, I hope. <laughs> No input, no exhaust, no heat, no cooling system required, very little maintenance, one moving part. There you are. Happy birthday, John. Next time I'll see you. Uh, this is, uh, these are my gases now that I do buy, and you can buy them anywhere. They're raw gases. Helium, neon, argon, krypton. I'll buy them raw. I'll treat them over there. When they're ready, we put them in this little bottle, and they're ready to... 
fuel any any of my engines anywhere in the world. So you can take this to the moon and fuel the engine and we've got power up there for the next 10, 20 years. There's enough in here to fuel maybe 10,000 automobiles for the next 10 years. Not bad. <laughs> wow. Over and out. Thank you. Happy birthday, John. What do you I'm say Anthony. to this? What? What do you say to this? What do I say to this? Yeah. Hubba hubba. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's the beginning of the future right now. And happy birthday again. <laughs> no, I don't know what to say. Hope you have a whole bunch of them. <laughs> yeah. I have a, had a lot of them. Got to have a few more. And then um, hopefully we'll be in a better place where we don't need gasoline and nuclear energy and all that crap. Yeah, we hope. As you can see, John, I don't have any equipment. No equipment. Go ahead, show my <laughs> boxes of junk. I have no power, no equipment uh, at all. Wait a minute. I have a voltmeter. <laughs> My That's it. Okay, we're going to give you just a demonstration to show that the bottom portion runs and works. Okay, we have a uh, one-cylinder engine here behind us with a plexiglass and just one coil. Normally we have three coils, but we want to see the reaction, and that's the reason for the uh, plexiglass, so we can see what is actually happening inside the cylinder every time it fires. We have a very small amount of inert gases, namely helium, neon, argon, krypton, and xenon, in here for several purposes. Some of the gases basically will transfer energy, other gases will cool the cylinder. So the engine does not need a, uh, a cooling system at all. Uh, no fuel goes in, everything is sealed, and our cooling system, the engine cools itself. What I have seen and the effects that, that are seen on the videotapes that I personally took have not been tampered with in any way. In fact, most of the effects are not visible to the naked eye and were not even known about until I started replaying the, uh, the tapes back frame by frame and started noticing incredible anomalies that could not be accounted for by any other, uh, any, uh, anything that I'd ever heard of or seen before. I would observe them remove all the, uh, the air from the cylinder and register uh, negative two atmospheres of pressure and then saw them put in only 120 cc's which, um, and then, and then Ignited was able to push this piston down, which um, <laughs> is not considered possible under the current laws of physics, which would allow for uh, an, er an inner gas to produce light, but not pressure. There appears to be that in the, in the vacuum, or the most vacuum with a slight amount of noble gases, they're, they're charging and it creates a, a frequency that acts as an antenna and, and draws in certain energies 
There it is. See, there's no reaction yet, no blast. And then the next frame or two, there. See the green on the outside? White. Intense light. There's a white light. Well, the theory is now that uh, the vacuum here acts an antenna for positrons, and that the positron will be drawn in and connect up with one electron. And each blast is only the firing of one electron. The daggers of light would move towards the cylinder. As soon as it touched the cylinder, there would be a flash between frames, and then a plasma reaction would occur, which is, we're somewhat familiar with plasma reactions, and then the piston would be pushed down. And also another amazing thing is, it seems to be linear force rather than the usual three-dimensional force that we're familiar with, where it's just an explosive, a three-dimensional explosion. It's, it appears to be force in one direction also. There's that longitudinal serrated, very wide at the bottom, then to the right you can see how it's serrated, longitudinal energy that was released. And it works. So um, we have a two-cylinder engine which we're now perfecting. All the components work. Okay, that's our uh, top plate, aluminum top plate. Um, this is just a sleeve. It's plastic. Uh, we just bought it from somewhere. And they come off. And they're just bit basically to hold the coils, three coils on each piston that we use to create a very powerful electromagnetic force field. Now, the uniqueness of this is that this engine is not radioactive, it doesn't pollute, uh, there's no fission, no fusion, so there's no danger of running it in this community, in any community. Uh, we don't pollute. And then there's a top piston that comes in here, and it seals the gases, and this will move up and down. The torque that we have tested already on a dyno is a thousand feet pounds of torque. So you want to compare it to any car, a normal car is about 250 feet pounds of torque. And there you can see our engine running steady at um, about 120 RPM. There's a coupler to the flywheel. We just want to do a test here. See how now we've got 519, 520. We're talking about no fuel. We run nothing, we burn nothing, and we use nothing. This is the head of the piston. And then here we'll go, uh, we'll put um, Teflon rings which will seal the piston itself so that none of the gases can escape. This is stationary. This one will move up and down, you see. There's another portion that goes here, and the top plate we took off, okay, it'll bolt on top so that this will, this will remain stationary. Okay, uh, every cylinder will be like this, but steel, not the engine. Um, and the amount of gas that goes in there, a very small amount that we put in here, we measured by CCs, um, would cost after processing all about 50 cents per cylinder. So it costs a dollar to run that engine for an extended period of time. And this is how you, uh, you can screw these off and, and refuel your uh, engine when it runs out of fuel, if it ever runs out of fuel. These inner gases, we have uh, calculated that they will run oh, maybe 10,000 hours. There's no limit. We don't know if it will run 20 years. We haven't run it 20 years, so we don't know. <laughs> We're going to give you just a demonstration to show that the bottom portion runs and works. We have the battery, and of course, the starter, and Jake's got the button. And it's going to be real noisy because it's a real big starter. If a regular automobile engine in mass production costs you, what, well, 5000 5, per engine, roughly? But it has so many components to it that we don't, and therefore this engine should be much cheaper than a, uh, than a standard combustion engine. Here we uh, are removing the batteries, which are two batteries, two 12-volt batteries from our engine. Um, Basically, we're trying to show that we do not need the batteries once the engine is uh, running. 
the engine will produce its own energy and can run without any input from any outside source whatsoever. And uh, this is one of the reasons we're doing this. Move the batteries out. Down there you can see a little pedal. We can use that as a, uh, like a pedal in your car. And you can adjust the timing sequence in the RPMs. Or we also have a hand rheostat where we can uh, adjust the, uh, the timing sequence of the engine, either fast or real slow. And here, uh, Joe is going to uh, increase and he can decrease the RPMs with a uh, hand rheostat. The engine here right now is doing about 700 RPMs. It's a two-cylinder engine, 400 horsepower, and we can produce approximately 350 kilowatt per hour by attaching a gearbox and a generator to it. This is a small engine. We can we can do four, six, eight-cylinder engines up to a megawatt if we want. We have it on a frame, bolted to a frame. There's a dyno. We're going to do a test with a dynamometer to show the power of the engine. Put a load on it without the batteries connected. Just the engine producing its own energy, its own power. And this runs just like a regular car engine, just has a, a um, key, push button, you can turn it on, turn it off, we'll show you uh, that we can turn the engine off and we start it up again just like you would your, your regular car. There's a generator up there and we have a belt. And on the side you see those long things are uh, resistors because we produce so much energy we have to dissipate about 300 amperes. And here we're going to drop the RPM real low. The engine will not shake, lower rod, very solid, very smooth running at any RPM. So it's doing about 75 there. And then he'll increase it again. We're watching something that I feel has never been observed before. I mean, the, the, the particle accelerators that Jimmy was talking about, they're surrounded with huge mega gauss magnets. You know, and they're completely enclosed, and there's no way to observe the reaction except by, in, you know, the effects that it creates in like a, a, a cloud chamber or something like that, where we see the effect of the thing but not the thing directly. So this may be one of the few um, opportunities we have to see under controlled circumstances where we can actually watch an, uh, an effect like this. We can build anything. If it's just, if we have the money, let's do a four, let's do a six. Uh, six cylinder will give us about. 1,200 horsepower. The videotape you are about to see is to demonstrate the Sabori inert gas vacuum engine. A forerunner to this engine was brought to this country by Joseph Papp, a Hungarian refugee. Mr. Jimmy Sabori joined him in 1985 and invested a large sum of money in the venture. Mr. Papp refused to share the technology with Mr. Sabori as per their agreement, which ended the matter in federal court in Tulsa, Oklahoma in 1988. In the settlement, the judge instructed Mr. Papp to work with Mr. Sabori on the technology and to sign a subsequent agreement of ownership percentages. Papp 51 percent, Sabori 49. The following year, Mr. Papp died of colon cancer and took his technology to the grave with him, having destroyed all the blueprints, formulas, and equations, and leaving Mr. Sabori with absolutely nothing. During the last five years, Mr. Sabori has developed a one-cylinder as well as a two-cylinder engine. 
The one-cylinder engine has a clear plastic plexiglass sleeve, so the reaction can be monitored for research purposes. Mr. Sabori has now mastered a new technology, superior to PAPS, using small amounts of helium, neon, argon, krypton, and xenon within a sealed vacuum. As you will see with Mr. Sabori's engines, there is no exhaust, no combustion, no cooling system required. And yet, the technology can produce an engine capable of developing as high as 350 horsepower with only two cylinders and at very low RPM. Larger engines can be developed later with four, six, eight, or even 12 cylinders. The following videotape was compiled from rare pieces of research video documentation designed for technical use only, which contain segments of very poor quality. Therefore, each section will be prefaced with a few introductory notes. In this section, we will see several views of the PAP engine prototype running in a small one-car garage while attached to several instruments one of which is a dynamometer indicating torque and horsepower output of the engine. The voiceover is that of Mr. Sabori. We will see three persons. First, Joe Papp, who is wearing a blue shirt and is tall with a distended stomach due to the advanced colon cancer. We will see Mr. Sabori, who is thin and medium-heighted, and a Ron Weiss, who is shorter and somewhat portly. The opening shot is of two 12-volt batteries, which we will see Mr. Papp disconnect from the engine, which is off-screen and above the batteries. The apparent engine noise is actually due to the vibration of the engine against the plywood floor of the garage, to which it was bolted without rubber mountings. The engine by itself is remarkably quiet. Here we uh, are removing the batteries, which are two batteries, two 12-volt batteries from our engine. Um, basically, we're trying to show that we do not need the batteries once the engine is uh, running. The engine will produce its own energy and can run without any input from any outside source whatsoever. And uh, this is one of the reasons we're doing this. Move the batteries out. Down there you can see a little pedal. We can use that as a, uh, like a pedal in your car. And you can adjust the timing sequence and the RPMs. Or we also have a hand rheostat where we can uh, adjust the, uh, the timing sequence of the engine, either fast or real slow. And here uh, Joe is going to... Uh, increase and he can decrease the RPMs with a hand rheostat. The engine here right now is doing about 700 RPMs. It's a two-cylinder engine, 400 horsepower, and we can produce approximately 350 kilowatt per hour by attaching a gearbox and a generator. To it. This is a small engine. We can we can do four, six, eight cylinder engines up to a megawatt if we want. We have it on a frame, bolted to a frame. There's a dyno. We're going to do a test with a dynamometer to show the power of the engine. Put a load on it without the batteries connected. Just the engine producing its own energy, its own power. And this runs just like a regular car engine, just has a, a um, key, push button, you can turn it on, turn it off, we'll show you uh, that we can turn the engine off when we start it up again, just like you would your, your regular car. There's a generator up there, and we have a belt, and on the side you see those long things are uh, resistors because we produce so much energy we have to dissipate about 300 amperes. And here we're going to drop the RPM real low. The engine will not shake, throw a rod, very solid, very smooth running at any RPMs. 
Let's do it about 75 then. And then he'll increase it again. The engine is made to run at about 400, 500 RPM. And then if we need uh, more RPM, we can put a gearbox on there and increase the RPM to whatever we want. If we're running, instead of a dynamometer, we can run a generator. Now here the RPM is going to go real low. Here they are. Might be uh, 50 RPM. Still the engine runs. Doesn't shake. Doesn't quiver. Now we shut it off so we can show you we shut it off. Now we're um, showing the uh, the dynamometer readout and we're at 123 RPM, 120 RPM with 276 foot pounds of torque being applied to the engine. The engine is running, as you can see, at 120 RPM, real smooth. And we're going to put a very heavy load on it, up to 500 foot-pounds. Um, we're going to try to go... As, here we, we went as low as 112 RPMs, and we didn't want to go any lower than that because we didn't want to um, harm the engine, which is the only one we had. So uh, 112 was about as low as we could get. This is a very heavy tractor type uh, hydraulic uh, dynamometer. And there you can see our engine running steady at uh, about 120 RPM. There's a coupler to the flywheel. And you can see that uh, it's a very heavy coupler. And the engine, like I say, is very powerful. It can run at any RPMs and will not quiver or shake it and real smooth and see how heavy that dyno is. It's run hydraulic. Hydraulically cool, cooled with water also. The engine runs at about uh, 130 R, uh, degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, 140, we, it got to 140 sometimes. There's a battery still disconnected. Um, we have no cooling system in the engine. The engine does not require a cooling system. As I mentioned, it uh, stays at about 140 when you're putting a load on it. So that's, you can touch it, it's not, not very hot. Actually, it's quite, but lukewarm. There's your dyno. The dyno has its own batteries. And then uh, we'll see what the readout is, and we will adjust the RPMs and increase the, um, torque or we can increase the RPMs and drop the torque. There's 116 now RPMs and 278 foot pounds of torque. Uh, we can run this engine at about 100 horse and uh, 100 horsepower at, at these low RPMs. And uh, like I say the maximum horsepower of the engine is uh, 400. Running slow, so uh, we just want to do a test here. See how now we've got 519, 520 RPMs. There's your reserve foot pounds of torque on the right, uh, the other readout on the right, which means we can add another 400 foot pounds of torque. So basically, about a thousand foot pounds of torque is what this engine can withstand. And as I say, the lowest we would run it on a load is about 112. There it is, 113. 112 with 500 foot-pounds of torque. That's, that's the best that we wanted to, to do. showing 11 horsepower over here to your right, the top right one. We've got 294 
uh, put upon the torque in reserve. And then we'll, it will increase and adjust any way we want. Increase the horses, increase the RPMs, drop the RPMs, increase the foot-pounds of torque. And we'll show you on this readout. Now we're um, running real fast. Well, not real fast, but about 700 RPMs. The torque is always basically the same regardless of your horsepower. So we don't have to run our engine faster than four or 500 RPMs. Uh, 700 would be a good uh, good speed for the engine. And there you are, 716 RPMs and 770 foot-pounds of torque, 105 horsepower. Actually, the uh, dynamometer got hot on this. But the engine did not. section we see Jimmy and his brother Jake taking apart one of the engines Jimmy designed. They demonstrate the inner workings, the construction of the cylinder chamber, and the cranking motion of the engine. This was not a running engine, but one under development. Now what we're going to do is show you what's inside the engine, because once we seal it, and uh, Jake will take the bolts off. Eventually we have a plate here, aluminum plate, that'll cover it. All it'll be is just a covered plate here. And we'll screw it to here, and we'll screw it to the bottom plate. And we're gonna, once we seal it and we, and we put the, 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 the gases on, uh, then you cannot see what's inside the engine. That's our uh, top plate, aluminum top plate. Um, this is just a sleeve, plastic. Uh, 
know, they just bought it from somewhere. And they come off, and they're just fit basically to hold the coils, three coils on each piston that we use to create a very powerful electromagnetic force field. Now we'll take the, uh, the coils out and close the piston. These are the pistons, and this is the only moving part of the engine, actually. So you'll, we'll, we'll show you how the engine runs. Only the bottom part. We are going to start the engine with a starter. We want to show you everything that's inside the engine because, like I say, uh, we have all the rest of the bolts here. And there's six bolts that will go on here. All the bolts. And the way these bolts are going. Okay, let me show, let me bring this over here. And take that one off here. Uh, can you get a good shot of this? Okay, I'll turn it this way. This is the bottom of it. And it's solid and sealed. It's got threads in here, and you can see Jake is unscrewing it. We just thread it back. This is how you fuel the piston. The pistons are, are, are uh, toroidal in shape inside. Way down the bottom, it'll be donut shaped where the inner gases will be sealed totally. They cannot get out. This is actually a, a gas tank in which we put three cubic centimeters of gases, of inner gases, approximately, whatever centimeters are. And, a half inches or so. and then there's a top piston that comes in here and it seals the gases and this will move up and down like this and it goes up and down in the um, and we'll take this one out and we want you to see what that there is nothing in this engine Okay, this is the top part of the piston here. It's going to get shot the it's not quite ready yet. We'll leave that one up for a second. Bit. Show it this. this is the head of the piston. And then here we'll go, uh, we'll put um, Teflon rings, which will seal the piston itself so that none of the gases can escape. This is stationary. This one will move up and down. You see. There's another portion that goes here, and the top plate we took off, it, it'll bolt on top, so that this will this will remain stationary, and this one will fire back and forth. Oh, and then this is the, the electrodes. This is our insulator, and it insulates the electrodes from the metal portion. And we don't have the electrodes yet; they're being made. They will eventually go in there and bolt to the top. Okay, now we're going to take it apart and get you right down to the. Uh, you want to take the bolts off? Get you right down to the uh, crankshaft. So you can see that there is absolutely no room, actually, to put a, a battery or another little engine or chipmunks. So that one's on okay. And then, uh, Don, then I want you to bring the camera and we're going to take a shot straight down. And actually, you can see the rods here, the, the connecting rods in the crankshaft. Okay, you may have to watch your step here and then stand on top here. Hang on to the, to the bolt. And then we'll turn the by hand. Okay, hold it right there, Jake. Okay, now, now take a good... I don't know if we got enough light. There's not enough light to get down inside. Okay. Can you see some of it, though? No, uh, very little. Very little, okay. Okay, the, these are con rods, the connecting rods, and then they're hooked to the to the rod, and the rod is hooked onto your crankshaft. 
Okay. All right. Let's put it back. Uh, we're going to put the rods back because the oil will shoot right out. Up yeah, right. If, if we started the oil shoot up from, from here, this will stop the oil from going anywhere. It stays within the bottom part, goes back into the pan. On. And this is how you, uh, you can screw these off and, and refuel your uh, engine when it runs out of fuel, if it ever runs out of fuel. These inner gases, we have uh, calculated that they will run, oh, maybe 10,000 hours, maybe 15,000 hours. What will happen is something will break. We have resistors. And Diodes, cathodes, oil, battery, generator, and they'll break before before the engine will uh, before the engine will run out of fuel. We doubt that the engine. But when it does, we just change it, run it again. Okay, we're going to give you just a demonstration to show that the bottom portion runs and works. We have the battery, of course, the starter, and the big button. It's going to be real noisy because it's a real big starter, an original starter. In this section, we are going to see the actual firing reaction of the inert gases through the clear plexiglass sleeve of the firing chamber as it pushes the piston down with great force. This is not considered to be possible in mainstream physics. We are very familiar with the phenomenon of excited inert gases emitting light, as in neon lights. However, nowhere is it considered possible for inert gases, especially in a partial vacuum, to exert any significant force, not to mention one sufficient to push a piston. The very fact of this reaction we are about to see is a cause for quite a commotion in the scientific community. The piston is attached by connecting rod to the crankshaft and a heavy flywheel. A, a small, slow-moving motor is used to move the piston into the firing position. Okay, now we're going to see that shot in slow motion. There's the reaction. A lot of line. There's the green way over to the right side. And the reaction, and another reaction. Red, big reaction there. There goes the piston. All the way down. Okay, that was a good one. Yeah, that's the end. Maybe one or two more. I would like to say the gas. Okay. Yeah. One, two, zero. Whoa! It bounced! It bounced! 
Okay, here we go. There's the first light. Now we'll have the blast. Another one, real quick. There it goes. Wow. See that light green? The piston going down. There's a piston going down. And bounces right back. I mean, that was so strong, it just bounced right back. Great shot. Okay, there you go. There's a blast. A lot of green all the way around. Great shot. Look at that green out there. And there goes the piston. There's another shot of light. You can see the piston moving down. There's our angel. There we are. Bang. Light up on top. And there's the piston all the way down. And now it's bouncing back. There we can see it. Great shot. On, so I see it. Okay, today is uh, November 3rd, 1994, and it is quarter six in the City of the Angels. We're going to do uh, another one of our tests, and um, we're going to do actually two tests. One is the B engine, which we'll test for the gases only, which is the engine back here. And, um, and then we'll take the gases out of there since we, the only system we have is a syringe, uh, we, we haven't yet perfected our little manifold system, which we will get it. Um, so we'll take the gases out of the B engine, and we're going to put them into the, a, the B engine, and then we're going to try to fire it. That doesn't mean it's going to fire. This is our first attempt. And just like the other engine, we had at least 100 attempts, and they all failed until we finally hit pay dirt, and she works. Um, but if she does, then this engine is exactly like a two-cylinder engine, except it's just one cylinder. All the components in this engine are identical to a two-cylinder engine. So this one works, so will a two-cylinder engine. So we're ready to do our test, and uh, away we go. Okay, today is November the 5th, uh, City of Angels. And we are here once again, and we will now... Oh, 94. <laughs> and we're going to um, do a demonstration here, a test on the B engine, using only a capacitor as input power. Um, we... Uh, I'm not too sure that it will work, but we'll give it a try, as in uh, all the attempts we did with the A engine. Uh, we, we made our attempts, and we finally found our correct potential and uh, our discharge range. So in this uh, case, this is our second attempt, and then we'll do a third attempt 
to uh, fire the engine and um, and see if we can move the piston down. We can fire the engine, but we need to show pressure with the piston moving down. And as I have mentioned before in previous videotapes, that all the components now in this engine are similar to the components that will go into a two, four, six, eight cylinder engine. So it is imperative that this engine functions correctly. And if it does, then all the others will function correctly. And the only problem we'll have with the two cylinder engine is the, uh, the, the timing sequence and the transfer of energies from one cylinder to another. So we are ready and we will fire away. <laughs> Are we ready? Yeah. Yeah. Like yeah. Okay. okay, we uh, we fired four. We we fired the the fourth um, generation gases, and of course they all worked. And what we're going to do next is we're going to we pulled some more CCs out, and then uh, we lost more. So evidently there shouldn't be anything. In, there never was anything in there, was there? And we got a leak at the bottom. We got a leak. We got a leak at the bottom. We got a leak at the top. Everything is coming out. We're going to give it one more shot. Call it a day. Six o'clock. Let it run. Just uh, let it go. Keep it on. Yeah. <laughs> 